All right, so um, what is this map time thing all about? Uh, so first of all, um, it's uh, hands-on time for uh, learning about maps. So the, the whole idea is that um, this is a technology that's becoming a part of most people's lives and um, professions. And it still, despite the best efforts of a lot of really brilliant people, um, remains kind of fussy and highly technical and difficult to access. Um, but it shouldn't, it doesn't have to be. So, uh, what we're really here to do is sort of demystify some of the intimidating parts, um, of the field and try to make them more accessible to everyone and not just, um, the folks who tend to be, uh, technologically inclined or already in a specific field. Um, it's always beginner focused, um, so try to be as welcoming as possible. Um, and there's an open, an emphasis on, um, open source because that's what's available to most folks, and um, it's something that we can all contribute back to. Um, on programming, um, which is not as intimidating as it sounds, um, and then web-based web mapping, because it's something we can share with one another um, and put out into the world um, for everyone to see. Um, so map time is also not just in Chicago. There, right now, I think there are 47 different chapters of map time on four different continents all over the world. It's an extremely active and friendly community um, of really interesting people, so uh, I would suggest looking into it on Google and um, around the web uh, afterwards. And um, there are lots of map time resources all over the place. So if you have this open, these blue um, highlighted uh, text is there are actually links. So the first one is to the map time GitHub repository. There's lots of presentations um, and stuff up there, and then uh, map time Chicago on the web. So I post. Um, if we do any sort of like coding exercises or there's any data that comes out, I try to keep it posted on the MapTime Chicago website. Um, and then also on Twitter and all over the place. Um, so again, the mission is to open the doors of cartographic possibility to anybody who's interested, um, <coughs> which I think is kind of cool. Um, and then it exists because uh, community in inclusivity and accessibility are really important to having a positive learning experience. So just as a little aside to how MapTime got started, there's actually um, some folks at a, de a design firm called uh, Stamen out of uh, San Francisco, where some of the designers were working on um, some cartography stuff and were having a hard time understanding how all the GIS bits worked together. Um, so some of the developers at that firm started up a, like a weekly learning thing where folks from the company could come learn how stuff worked. And then because they're a creative design company type of group. Um, it was friendly and kind of quirky and interesting, and it just happened to catch on all over the place. Um, we're even working on an official code of conduct, which if you're interested in looking at that, um, that, that link will take you there, and you can, um, you can make comments if you want. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's kind of the, the background of map time and what this is all about. But today, uh, we're going to learn how web maps work. Um, and it's going to be pretty basic and go through just like the, the high level mechanics of what's going on when you access a map on the web. Then we're going to build a simple map together and it's going to be great. Um, and if you'd like to contribute to map time, um, come grab me afterward and let me know um, how you'd like to be involved. Cool. And uh, again, thanks to uh, Smart Chicago for hosting us. This is a great space to have a meeting and food is amazing. All right, so on to the main attraction. So this is the anatomy of a web map <coughs> presentation. Um, these two folks, Alan and Beth, are from Stamen Design in San Francisco. This is one of, actually one of the first presentations they put together. So some things are actually already dated, even though this came out like two years ago. And I'll try to point those out as we go through. Um, so you can uh, follow along if you put in this, this URL. It's um, sta.mn slash qhg, if you can't read it. Raise your hand if you need anything. You got it? Cool. We'll give that a second. Um, again, just to orient you, uh, links are in the blue boxes, and then green is emphasis. And then this whole presentation is on GitHub, so you can, um, you can download it and edit it if you want, or make suggestions for some of the out-of-date stuff that might need to be updated. 
Everybody got it? Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. So um, again, we're going to be talking about the very most basic principles of web mapping. I'm going to try not to get into any specific tools or platforms that are out there, but really talk about how stuff works at a base level so you can better understand you know, how you might approach solving a problem. Um, there's a bit of history in here, um, which I think is really cool, um, and it gives us a little bit of basis for how we got to where we are now. And then, um, of course, again, there's lots of exceptions, especially as technology moves um, through time. We're going to talk a lot about Google, because Google Maps has obviously changed the landscape of, of mapping um, over the last decade or so. Um, but everything that we work on later is going to be 100% open source. OK, so first, um, what does anatomy have to do with map? Um, well, bodies and maps have components and systems that interact with one another, um, and we're going to try to explain those. So just like your body has a digestive system, um, a nervous system, and a circulatory system that all interact to make you work, um, maps have, uh, have data instead of cells. Um, instead of circulatory systems and digestive systems, there are styles um, and map tiles and servers and lots of other stuff that all work together in concert. Um, they work alone to do specific things, but together they make the maps actually work. All right. So uh, what exactly is a web map? Um, it might be better to ask, how is a web map different from a digital map? Digital involves a computer, um, but might not actually be accessible by the internet. And a web map is similar because it is digital, um, but it's, uh, it's different because it lives on the web and it's designed to be accessed and interacted with um, via the web instead of as a static output. Um, so we're talking about browsable maps like OpenStreetMap, um, which we've talked about in the past and we will certainly talk about again at a future meeting. Um, everybody's uh, go-to Google Maps, um, and then stuff like Stamen, they actually uh, make their own custom maps that you can use for stuff. Um, some things that we're not going to talk about today are mobile device-specific maps or digital globes like Google Earth, which actually function a bit differently. And um, actually, since this came out, a lot of services are moving toward digital globes in the browser, which Google Maps is sort of becoming these days, but um, I digress. <laughs> um, so how did web maps come to be in the first place? So first, there were digital maps like in, in ArcGIS, which I know a lot of folks in the room, including me, sort of came up on um, traditional desktop GIS. But when it was ported um, to the web, um, it was not always as user friendly and could be slow and difficult to interact with. So in 1996, uh, MapQuest launched its web service, which um, I know a lot of folks in here remember typing in your directions, and printing out your paper maps, and stapling them together to bring on your road trip or wherever you were going. Um, so it was online, and there were directions, and it really paved the way for the web maps that we use today. Um, but it was super slow for one reason in, in particular. So it required. Um, the full page that you were viewing to refresh and reload um, if you were going to scroll or zoom around the map. And it was always aligned to specific tile boundaries. So unlike Google Maps where you can kind of like, you can move in an infinite number of ways around the map, with MapQuest you could only move to specific boxes. So Google Maps um, really paved the way for online mapping in 2005. So does anyone remember this interface? Right, show of hands. A couple people. Yeah, I don't really either. Um, but what their revolution was um, was not the interface or their specific branding or anything like that. It was what is called um, the tile. So web maps today um, are made up of tiles, and we're going to go into that um, in some detail here. But um, I just want to give some credit to. Uh, Lizzie Diamond, who's a map time person who put together a lot of this information. Um, and now she does uh, educational materials for um, Mapbox, who's a company that does all kinds of map services these days. But anyway, so um, this is not 
totally true today because of some new technological changes, but it is true for a lot of maps that you still use. Um, so all maps are the same size, which is 256 by 256 um, pixels. And they all, regardless of the service, have the same boundaries. So you can see this animated GIF scrolling through a bunch of different stuff. So there's actually some statement maps, um, Bing, Google, something else, Mapbox, I think. OpenStreetMap is up here, too. But these are all the same tile. Um, and they correspond to the same place in space. So they could be anything. Um, they could be a roadmap or a satellite image or some kind of hyper-stylized um, mixture of the both of them. But the great thing about them is that they load much faster than having to load one huge map every time you change the page. So everybody's sort of experienced this as the squares in the map fill in. And what's happening is your browser is actually downloading all those little squares and putting them in the right place in your browser for you. So um, one of the things that Google did was created this thing that people call um, a slippy map. So what happens is when you're viewing a specific place on a map, the tiles that are outside of you will start to preload as you're viewing it so that when you move the map around, those images are already there in the map. So that's kind of a key innovation that happened on the web. So everyone knows what this looks like, but here it is. So the, all the tiles that are outside of the original view have preloaded in the map and they're ready to be displayed. And then um, there are these things called zoom levels. So if you've noticed on a map, when you scroll in with your mouse wheel or you pinch and zoom on your phone, um, it usually zooms in and kind of stops at given spots along the path to being zoomed all the way in or zoomed all the way out. And these are called zoom levels. And there's usually a given set of zoom levels that set the limit on the map, and each one of them has its own characteristics. So zoom level zero is one map for the whole world. So the entire world in 256 by 256 pixels. Um, and then as you zoom in, the number increases exponentially. So zoom level one is four tiles. Um, zoom level three, four, and five um, uh, grow exponentially accordingly. So you, you get the idea. So this is what um, zoom level 13 looks like if you kind of separate the tiles from each other. <clears throat> um, yeah. This might be obvious. Sorry. Sure. So, um, tiles are always built to the same scale in the same API, so they're always like four hundred feet or a half mile. So for each, yeah. So it would be the same scale for that zoom level. So the so the there's this in uh, GIS, and if other GIS folks want to jump in and correct me because at geography. It, the ge geographic theory is actually not my strong point, <laughs> but um, this concept of scale, so you have like the one to an X number, right. so the pixel to the number of feet would change um, if you, as you go from zoom level zero all the way into the maximum zoom level. So for zoom level zero, one pixel might be several hundred miles, but as you get into the closest one, it might represent um, a handful of feet. Does that make sense? I guess I, so for some reason, I, I, I don't know, this might not be important to the content, but I, I guess I'm still confused because I thought that, so if you're zooming out to see more of the geography, then that isn't an, in, that's an increase in the number of tiles. Is you're zooming out, it's you're, a just, decrease. So the, the, um, the number of tiles that you're gonna see on your laptop screen, uh -huh. That's pretty much always going to be the same, right? It's like that's going to depend on the size of your laptop screen. Say, like, you know, your laptop screen is like it's like three tiles by five tiles, right? That that means it's like like fifteen hundred pixels by x number of pixels. Um, as you zoom in and out, the number of miles, let's say, that each of those pixels represents, that's what's going to change. So the tiles actually, if at different zoom levels, there's actually different. Tiles. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Different tiles. Yeah. Different tiles. Yeah. Right. It's just like take a different set. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to me. No, that's a great, a great you know, question. The, yeah. the, the points you raised, uh, <clears throat> you to think of the in flat maps, you have a scale, mm -hmm. and I, mean, I was I was trying to come up with the equivalent. Is there an equivalent? 
So, I mean, like, the equivalent might be like, let's think of in Google Maps there's that slider on the right. side. Yeah. So, um, you can think of it as like when you're dragging that slider, you're, you're picking the tile set that you're going to be using. So, the only question is you don't know. Well, you, I mean, I don't well, know. Well, it's not really kind of technical here. Yeah. You don't know, like, are we at Zoom level 13 or Zoom level right. 14? <clears throat> but, but that's kind of the idea, yeah. So, the, the map, the paper map analog the big citywide map or the inset that shows the loop? Um, so, there are about, like, I mean, it kind of depends, but there are, like, probably 30 of the maps. Like, most maps that you see are not going to get up to 30 because they don't have that level of detail. So, like, in the low 20s, it's just it's kind of the typical. Um, so, um, and we'll, we'll actually show you what, how the servers that serve up all these different tiles work in a second. Um, but that's a really great point that there's, um, as you, it's different from digital maps in one way in that like, if you make a map in Arc, Arc Map, you can kind of set an arbitrary scale so you can zoom in at an infinite distance um, you know given the constraints of your data but on a web map it's usually um, set to like like we like in the low 20s number of scales that you could use if that makes sense and there's some kind of finer points about about that that are that I'm sort of averaging out but that's the general concept if that makes sense other questions? Cool. Well, that's a really good question. Okay, so um, the advantage, one of the advantages of using tiles is that you can render each one in advance and then store them to be accessed later. So when you open up like a GIS program, you usually have a bunch of different types of data um, that can be, sometimes they can be very large and each different data set can be pretty large in size. And if you only want to look at a part of it, a lot of times you still have to have all that data on your hard drive and you have to load it in. And then the software has to do a bunch of work um, rendering it all perfectly for you in the screen. So if you make a bunch of tiles, what you're doing is basically doing all that work up front and then letting the users who are accessing it on the web, web take advantage of that work later on by downloading a pre-rendered uh, image, if that makes sense. Um, and then they're stored in uh, a cache or on a server someplace. So uh, map tiles are just like any other image on the web. So you can link to them individually, which we'll show you here in a second. So if you have it open, um, you want to click on this link, but open it in another tab. Do like the right click, open in another tab, so you don't have to reload everything. Um, so this is going to show you one tab, one tile, which should look like this. We can also, if you want to share one of your neighbor's screens too, because this is um, just kind of a quick little demo. All right. So um, let's break down what this URL is actually doing here. So the highlighted part in green, this is the name of the tile server. So this is openstreetmap.org. Um, it's tile.openstreetmap.org. So this is where the server that's going to be serving up all these little images and making them into a map for you. And then as we move from left to right, um, that first one, number four, this is actually denoting the Z value or the zoom level. So that we're at zoom level four. And then the next two numbers, two slash six, this is the X, Y value or the place um, in the grid of tiles um, where this image lives. So what this URL is actually doing is giving you an address giving the computer an address on where to find um, these little images that you want to look at. So again, and this is what it looks like. So you could go into the URL and you could change some of these values and um, you could see different images pop up. So like we can put in um, zoom level three and we have um, a zoomed out image. This is I think somewhere in Canada. Does that make sense? Cool. And so that's how all the different um, map services work. And you can actually go to, so if you go to openstreetmap.org and let it load, um, if you guys can see this or not, you probably can't. 
But up here in the, once it's loaded, up here in the URL bar, you can see it says equals 5 slash 86.359 slash 70.840. So it's actually loading it up and saying exactly where in, um, in the map it is. So all these addresses are kind of up there in the URLs, and we just don't notice them because why would you need to know that information when you're looking at the map? All right. So um, Google Maps uses what's called a Mercator projection, and most map web maps do, um, which is designed for sailors, um, but it works well for flat maps. So this is what the globe looks like in Mercator projection. Um, it should be pretty familiar to everybody. Um, and we'll talk about these in greater detail uh, later, but it's kind of important to what happens later on in this um, workshop. But there will be another workshop in the future where we'll get into this in depth. But suffice it to say that uh, projection is just a mathematical way of turning a round object, like the Earth, into a flat representation, like a map. Okay, so um, all of the Slippy Maps and Slippy Map software sort of follow Google's lead um, with tiles at the base. Um, so not surprisingly, a collection of raster tiles, um, which are what we just looked at, make up what's called the map's base layer. Um, when we layer things like markers on top of them, um, we call these data layers, uh, or content layers, or feature layers, or other things sometimes. But these are the main things that we, the main terms that we use. And not every map contains a feature layer, but um, they're pretty typical sometimes. Um, so. These data layers that layer on top of our base map that's composed of tiles um, are often vector layers. Um, so does anyone here know the difference between a raster and a vector? Sure. Um, does it, do you want to explain it real quick? Sure. I didn't know if you were talking to me or not. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, a raster is a, is a fixed size array of, of pixels. So it's, it's going to have. 200 by 200 pixel values in it. Uh, a vector is something that can be scaled. It, it's described more like by a, uh, by a formula. So it can be scaled up and down sort of all the time. I'm sorry? No. Well, no, it's the difference between. Um, Think about a uh, scoreboard. Uh, you can describe a line either as turning on this cell, and this cell, and this cell. This thing, or in vector terms, you could say a line from this point to this point. Great explanation. Cool. So, um, so the data layers that we put on top of our base maps are usually made out of vector data. Um, so sometimes you interact with these things by clicking on them, which might pop up some an information bubble or do other things. Um, so there's a few different file types out there. This is just a small sample. Uh, so GIS usually uses what's called a shapefile. Um, and web maps used to use uh, KMLs predominantly, but more recently are moving toward um, what's called GeoJSON. Um, so here's the breakdown of all these, how all these things fit together. So here's our base map. Um, this is made out of raster data, some pre-rendered images that are served up as tiles. Um, the styling has been done using one particular piece of software um, called Tile Mill. And then there are data layers on top of it, so like some points and lines connecting the points and polygons. So um, this illustrates uh, the comment about how uh, you can describe a vector by saying that different points in space are connected to one another. So this is what that would look like. Um, so moving on. Um, any questions so far? Great. All right, so now um, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into web map anatomy. So the simplest map, not maybe not the simplest possible map, but a simple one, is here at this link. So we'll open that up. And it looks just like that last slide. So. dot mn slash v5h. Yep. Cool. So um, this is what it looks like. 
Um, it's just a simple slippy map, and you can see the tiles filling in as I pan, pan around. Um, and then there's a point on here that we can click to see that it's Parasome. And then this is the next slide in the presentation is what the code for that looks like. And we'll get into this in some more depth here in a minute, but this is um, this is all that it takes to make this map work from our perspective. There's a lot of things going on in the background, um, but this is it. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that here in a second. And then this looks really complicated and um, intimidating, but it's really just describing that um, here on the left side of the screen, these are some things that some person has already done to create some nice looking tiles, which are then sitting on a server someplace. And then we have um, some feature layers that we might have created. Maybe it's um, we want to draw a boundary around a collection of things that we want to show someone. Um, and then those come together in this file, which is um, using the languages of the web. So it's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then all those things are interacting to create the result in our browser. OK, so what does the JavaScript part do? Um, this is, uh, this is something that Justin brought up. So he works on um, a library called, a JavaScript library called Leaflet that folks may have heard of um, that actually grabs all these different tiles, um, adds content to the top of them, handles our interaction with it, and then makes it all work in the web page. Um, so again, here, in, if, you, if you're following along, these links are all clickable. So it's called Leaflet, but there are other um, JavaScript libraries out there that can render stuff in the browser for you. Um, like Open Layers, which apparently was making a comeback in 2013, um, Modest Maps, Polymaps, and then there's a few others as well. Um, and then there are lots of APIs out there that you can tap into. So folks are probably familiar, at least somewhat, with the Google Maps API. If you've ever seen a map embedded in someone's website, that's what it's using. Um, and then Bing and Nokia and um, S3. Um, all have their own APIs that you can use. OK, so let's talk about a couple different exceptions. So number one, tiles are always rasters except when they're not. Um, there is this new thing um, that's gaining a lot of momentum right now called vector tiles. And so what this is, um, is it's instead of rendering a bunch of images ahead of time, what it does is it slices up your vector data into tiles um, that then can be rendered when you need it. Um, so to make a comparison for a raster, you ask for data that fits in the tile, and for the vector tiles, you already have your data sliced up in the way that you want uh, um, it to be made into raster tiles later on. So this is, we're not going to get into this too much today, but it is a thing that's out there. Um, and Google Maps has actually switched over. If you've, if you've gotten switched over to their new map, um, style and you missed the old map style. The old map style is raster and the new one is vector. Um, so anyway, someone has to go through all your data and chop it up and put it somewhere um, and there are a few different ways to do that. Mapbox is a company that does that. Um, that's their business model. Um, exception number two, um, you can't interact with features on a raster um, but there are a couple things that make that possible. One is called UTF grid, and this isn't super common, but it's just sort of to illustrate the constraints of working with uh, raster data. So here, this is actually a map behind the text, um, but what has happened is someone has, has mapped a bunch of um, arbitrary characters on top of it, and then when users click on specific areas that have these characters on them, it will pop up with interactive information. Um, so one example that you can see, um, you can click on this Car Parks Conservancy map, and see what that looks like. So this is a, a park service map that um, Stamen made, and all these little features are clickable thanks to the UTF grid that they use. Um, but since this was put together, much of this has been addressed with um, vector tile approaches. Questions? Great. OK, exception number three, um, you'll probably, as you're, if you're looking into making maps in the web or visualization, you might run into something called D3, which is data-driven documents. Um, it exists outside the world of tiles. Um, you can't easily make a roadmap in D3 because there's a lot of data in a roadmap, but you can do other things that are hard to do um, with other web map technologies like 
choropleth maps. So these are these um, maps where you would color um, a bunch of different geographies based on some values. Or cartograms, which are these squishy maps where things are resized to um, reflect some value. You've probably seen these floating around. Um, or you can actually do different map projections um, right in your browser, which is something that has been difficult to do with other libraries um, in the past. And if you um, click around or look into some of the projection demos, the D3 for D3, it's pretty impressive how quickly um, this browser-based technology can do projections. Um, so D3 is insane. There <laughs> is, just look around at some of the demos. They're all really, really cool. Um, this link here will bring you to lots of really interesting eye candy stuff that's just fun to look at. Um, but there's, uh, it's, it's powerful, super difficult to learn, but um, really, really interesting. Okay, so where would you start? Um, do you need to make your own custom tiles? Um, if you don't, then you could just use any of these services, except for CloudMade, which doesn't exist in the way that it did when this was made anymore. Um, but you could use OpenStreetMap, Stamen, Mapbox, MapQuest, Bing, lots of other um, providers to pull in tiles to make your map. If you do need to make your own custom tiles, you could use a piece of software called TileMill, which is now called Mapbox Studio, um, to design your own tiles, which you can do all kinds of creative things with. Um, and then you can style your map with what's called Cardo CSS, which is sort of an, an adaptation of CSS, which is which is the um, styling language for the web. So someone made an adaptation of it where you can use the same types of principles to style your map. Um, you can host these files on mapbox.com, or you can roll your own server using some of these technologies here. So if you're inclined to do that type of thing, um, check out some of these links. It is a rabbit hole, um, but it's pretty interesting. Um, this link uh, I have to fix. This guy's, um, th that tutorial's not there, but if you search for this guy and GeoPlatform, there's a really good tutorial on how to set up your own, um, your own tile server. It's very cool. Um, if you need a content layer, um, or if you don't need a content layer, you can put all your data into the tiles and possibly use UTF Grid for interactivity. But if you do, you can convert your data into a shapefile or a GeoJSON um, or KML um, with these tools on the screen. Finally, there are CardoDB is one example, but there are a lot of new tools out there in the world that do all of this for you on the web that are really aimed at um, ease of use and focused on the web-based interactivity of maps. Okay, so if you want to learn more about this, um, you can go to maptime.io slash lessons resources. There's lots of stuff up there, tons of tutorials. Um, and that is really it. Thanks to um, Lizzie and Stamen and the MapTime people and you guys.